and welcome to uh, supper time. It's supper time. Recently, a million cases of COVID were reported in the world and things are bad. We're playing around with a little bit of online backgrounds today. And my guest is someone who gets to speak to uh, the economic impacts of the fine arts world on our show. So let me put the silliness aside and actually introduce Lucy here. Lucy and I met a year or two ago when I reached out to her about some of the cool press she got and some of the work she was doing, actually in the, the meme and Snapchat space. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 for LACMA. So, so Lucy, would you tell us a little bit about uh, that whole situation? Well, I started working at LACMA after five years at the Met in 2015. Okay. And their strategy was already established to create pop culture references using their Snapchat account. I kind of took that strategy and ran with it and had so much fun using song lyrics, movie quotes, you name it. Anything that reminded me of something with artworks, it was really, really fun to around with their collection. They have an encyclopedic collection from all over the world, from all the way through time. And so it was really a wealth of content to be able to work with and share with our audiences. And, you know, at one point we had over 200,000 Snapchat followers and we would get 80,000 to 160,000 impressions on our stories. There were a lot of like statues singing Beyonce lyrics and fine art paintings saying like pop, pop culture references. It was good. It was really, really good. It was quality. Yeah, it was content. Class. Yeah, it was super cool. If you guys Google, I'll put a link in the show notes to some of the articles. But if you, if there were so many different, like, you have to follow LACMA on Snapchat articles that came out. So I think that's how I discovered the original. Yeah. It was cool to get a lot of attention and um, recognition for that. And just to see our audience resonate with the humor that I was injecting into the normally kind of conservative museum sphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so since then, we've gotten to connect over just being people who work in marketing and are doing marketing for various kinds of organizations. You've been very helpful guidance as I had my first few museum clients. And uh, we've sort of always had this back and forth going on about our marketing careers. So that's been a lot of fun. And then when I started the Supper Time series, you were like, I would love to talk about museums in this situation. So, so just right off the bat, I'm most curious to hear about sort of what you think this looks like for museums now? I know I know, no one really can make accurate predictions about the world going forward. None, none of us really know what's going to happen. But it looks awful dire. Uh, and I know you've done your research here. So you want to tell us a little bit about what things look like for museums now? Yeah, I mean, as you know, as many of you know, most of you should, most museums in uh, the United States and around the world have closed their doors due to social distancing mandates and best practices because you don't want to get together in a large group or a small space. And so because of those closures, many museums rely at least partially or sometimes entirely on visitation numbers and um, admission, titting and stuff like that. So the financial situation is a little bit or a lot scary for museums at this point, especially since the original expectation was to be closed for or six or eight weeks maybe, and now some of them have already stretched into uh, the end of June in their predictions, and maybe even longer. I've already heard of at least one museum that has announced it will not reopen, and several have laid off huge portions of their staff, furloughed, laid off, just don't have the bottom line in their budget to support a fully working from home staff, especially when so many have roles dealing with the public and visitors in person. So the estimated economic impact to date is $3.7 billion in the nonprofit arts and cultural sector. And the median damage per organization is around 33,000. So, you know, we've got a lot of museums <laughs> being impacted here. Yeah. And it's just, it's difficult to see the future here and, and see how we can innovatively move forward and keep these valuable organizations alive because they do provide not only learning opportunities for the public, but also they are um, cultivating culture and stewarding collections of um, historical artworks from all over the world. Like the reason we know about Egyptian history is because archaeologists dug up these 
artifacts and they now live in many museums around the world. So that scholarship does not stop. The curatorial departments all do research year round, uh, studying history, art. Um, there are so many technological um, advancements that come out of museum conservation and research. And definitely, so, I, I, so I'm really curious to explore with you. Yeah, 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 I'm curious to explore with you because I think there's a lot of overlap there between like research institutions and museums uh, and universities have, have been forced to make this same switch very recently and aren't quite going out of business yet. And so I'm sure there are some interesting overlaps there we can explore. But before we get to that, you have this quote from Laura Lott that sort of predicts the outcome for museums. What do you think about that? And what is that quote? So Laura Law is the president and chief of executive of American Alliance of Museums, which brings us all together to brainstorm ideas and collectively run our organizations collaboratively. And her estimate as of March 18th, so we're several couple weeks after this was published, she was saying three quarters of the museums in the United States are now closed and estimated that one third will not reopen if the crisis continues. And direct quote of this situation is far more dire than anything I've experienced in my 25 years being an arts finance professional. So you know, given the number that I mentioned earlier and just anecdotally seeing these museums closing and laying off stuff like it, the situation is real and it's going to be a, real struggle to kind of get everybody back online when they sort of go back to normal or yeah. when the new normal occurs. Kind of like that thing, yeah. That's, that is crazy. So as someone who has a, a, a bit of experience in this space, like what percentage of museums would you say, if you just had to ballpark it, have methods of revenue other than just donors that they raise every year and then ticket sales, right? Like, I know that there are some, like the the what is it, the Guggenheim or whatever, that that maybe have huge endowments or or you know some uh, significant part of their um, The Metropolitan Museum of Art has a nice endowment as well, and that money did come from donors or the original founders of the museums that endowed them to yeah, yeah. Uh, do their work, and so it is sort of a predecessor to having active donors and uh, consistent development departments yeah. pulling in fundraising. But the majority of museums don't operate a huge percentage of their operating costs will come from the visitor ticket sales. They come from donors and everyday people, wealthy people that and philanthropists really support their bottom line because even with huge visitor numbers in the millions, many of them, still would not be able to keep the lights on and conserve and protect artworks 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And all the museums that are still open are still not open, but still running currently have staff in-house security kind of protecting the facility itself and the artworks themselves. So in those artworks, I guess, natural history museums, um, science museums, anything across the board has to be, you know, guarded and just made sure that with the doors closed that everything's still kind of safe and protected. Right. So, some um, some yeah. museums have uh, have like uh, government support as well, right? In addition to their endowment, yeah. there's maybe also a, a paycheck from a local municipality or state government. Yeah, uh, that's quite common um, for larger museums in particular, some smaller museums as well. But, you know, the LA County Museum of Art is a good example because it's got county in the name, so the county of Los Angeles does provide a bit of its online annual funding, and the museum operates in a park on county land, similar to how the Metropolitan Museum is in Central Park, and they also get a portion of their bottom line played by the city of New York, and not only um, financially, but also through the use of the the space in the park, the square footage that the museum takes up at the Met yeah. is 2.4 million square feet of wow. Central Park. And they, you know, use that space through the generosity of the city from way back when, when it was founded in 1894. So That's so cool. Yeah. Okay. So, so in some, sometimes it's just the land grant and then other times it's direct financial support from 
Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Very so cool. they always have several revenue streams um, yeah. in addition to ticket sales and attendance, special exhibitions. And then they also have robust membership departments that provide extra benefits to people who sign up to support them annually as members. And usually in return, they get free admission for the year in, in <laughs> addition to some other perks. But member does go a long way in also contributing to those financial funding sources. Yeah, I remember in a conversation we were just having recently that we discovered what an impact memberships have versus just ticket sales. They really can make the difference in the museum's bottom line, especially lately if people aren't going to buy any tickets this year. Is there anything else you want to say about the larger impact of coronavirus on arts and culture before we move on to, because I really want to hear what you think museums are going to be able to do to pivot into to de deal with this issue. Anything you want to talk about before we move on? Um, you know, I just, I, I'm optimistic still, despite the dire um, forecasts. It's, it's really something that I've always been passionate about for most of my life, and especially since I started my career over a decade ago at Met. And I think and hope that there are others out there that really feel that museums are essential and culture is vital, and it's important to not only provide experiences for visitors, but also um, to to really protect and steward the history of our world. Yeah, I think if anyone in the world is qualified to talk on that, it's you as someone who's gotten 15 year olds excited about like, you know, a county art museum. That's pretty cool. Like, and so I think there's, there is a real opportunity for us to change how we engage with museums and with art culture. And, and maybe coronavirus will just play a part in making that more urgent for museums when they weren't really prioritizing social before. Maybe now this is a reason for them to think about it as, as like another uh, revenue stream, that sort of thing. So yeah, talk to me about some of the cool things museums are that you've already seen that they're doing. Yeah, yeah. So museums have been on social for probably about a decade or so, which is sort of a long time for many of them. You know, the smaller ones, lower budget ones have had a little bit harder time kind of uh, going up the uphill battle to... Even the Cowboys Museum is now finally on social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think they already had social media, but so the National Cowboy Museum, we'll start with that example for some kind of innovative way that they're using social media now that the physical space is closed. The National Cowboy Museum turned over their Twitter account and some of their social media accounts to Tim, the security guard. And he's, you know, sort of a middle-aged, like, guy, and he walks around the museum protecting their collection and, and their facility, and he just has a great time with incredible. social media. Yeah, he has some and of the best tweets. Authentic, it always works. And he's funny, and it's kind of yeah. hilarious that he's a bit of a social media novice, but he's in there and he's trying, and, and it, that's all that really matters is just making the effort. A couple other fun museum campaigns right off the bat are the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago has penguins touring the galleries. They have a video of them watching the other animals in their facility. So that's amazing. That's I haven't really seen cool that. Separate little mini cuts of them that's so you know, cool. touring the museum and looking at other animals. They had belugas with the, the penguins oh. were looking at belugas the other day. It was amazing. <laughs> that's so um, cool. <laughs> similarly, the Monterey Bay Aquarium did a, has been doing like a meditation. I think it's on Mondays. And it's just a 10 minute morning video looking at jellyfish or another animal in their care that is really relaxing to kind of stare at and maybe listen to a little background music. And it provides interesting content and solace for people that are sitting at home kind of going stir crazy, cabin feverish. And so those kind of things are really, really awesome one off examples. I will note that, like I said, many museums have been social media for years, but the pivot really has been recently that we don't have the physical space to contribute to the content production. So many times in the physical space, you're able to go with a picture in the galleries or interview a visitor or do something like that. And now it's just all online. So ones that were better prepared were the ones that invested in digital in the past, who had their collections online digitized, which has been a huge um, initiative across museums in this country and around the world and just bring uh, high quality images every object online and pairing them with curatorial 
scholar, scholarly information about each object. So there's a wealth of information out there. You just visit a museum's website and what they're doing on social in a lot of ways is just pushing those pieces of content out onto social. And then some of the other fun stuff that's happening and it's always been a really amazing, enjoyable career for me in part because it's so collaborative. There aren't like competition does not exist between social media managers and museums. We talk to each other all the time. We know, I know probably 30 or 40 American social media managers awesome. that uh, run the accounts for the different museums across the country and several around the world. And so we put our heads together and came up with some ideas for museum games, for example. Oh, cool. All crowdsourcing clues and answers from each museum each week. The Akin Art Museum in Ohio hosts their crossword puzzle roundup and it's contributed by 30 to 50 museums each week and each museum has its own clue and then everybody kind of cross promotes it sends the link to the crossword out and then sends their clue out and it's just a fun thing to kind of look at online that's really cool have you guys invited tim to be a part of that very exclusive club yet we've got to do that they yeah you gotta reach out to invited him. him yeah we have a facebook uh group that we converse on quite regularly many many times a day do make sure you invite him anyway. that. super so important i think he could he could use some guidance on how to take a selfie <laughs> probably probably that's awesome okay so so what other there are a couple games that people are figuring out how to do on social media this sort of stuff what else do you think i don't know do you see a way for museums to like actually start transferring some of their revenue generating like actually value bringing stuff to online and to social and are there examples of that you've already seen uh that you think people will be open to paying for i'm thinking a little bit about the university analogy when you mentioned research and, and that sort of thing supporting research institutions universities seem to have shanghai their way into being able to do classes online now and still have people pay them tuition cool that's great yeah. hopefully that lasts the whole however long this takes is there an analog for museums I hope so. I think it, they're a little more, it, it can be a little more difficult for museums to uh, put in place a model like that. I've seen personally that fundraising online has been slow on the uptake for our audiences because charitable organizations do so well on so, social media and online donations that museums and cultural institutions tend to seem like they have money, like even ones that have big endowments, their operating budgets and their bottom line are still pretty tight no matter what. And their staff is usually underworked, I mean, underpaid and overworked. So um, it's been a real challenge to try and convince audiences of the value and the need for support for online donations in particular. I have seen a couple successful um, museums, or I've seen a couple museums successfully use exclusive Facebook groups and exclusive online content to provide to their membership in particular. So not quite fundraising directly from a piece of content, but definitely providing value to to, um, people that pay to have free admission that cannot come anywhere to the physical space at this point. But yeah, I think there is opportunity there. And I think when done right and when both the need and the result will can be communicated properly. I think, you know, I hope that the audiences will see that need and, and resonate with it and, and feel engaged to support online or some other way, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, for example, the Facebook group model that you mentioned, how does that work for the museums that use it? I, I mean, I've heard of it. I haven't, full, I haven't personally run one, but I think how it works is they have a private Facebook group where they admit only members or only certain people that have for the museum. And then in that group, they can do Facebook live broadcasts with creators, lectures, type, those kind of things that provide extra information and direct access to a scholar who definitely in the front lines. But it's interesting that you mention how well nonprofits do on social media fundraising and this sort of thing. Cause you, you're totally right. Charity is, has taken like a fish to water to, to, to raising on social media, mm-hmm. but we don't really see really museums so. like that. Yeah. Yeah. You don't really see museums yeah, taking I, the same approach. Is there, what were you going to say? 
a lot of times, especially in times like these and with a uh, global impact of various economic issues that we've encountered in the last 10 years or so, do, and, and natural disasters, et cetera, we see the need directly for other human beings and these organizations that directly support them. And I think the value that needs to be communicated for museums in particular is that maybe it's not saving life, but it is saving a piece of history and knowledge that uh, we would have if a museum didn't um, study it and interpret it and send out information to the wider public for us to know. And so social studies classes wouldn't exist if we didn't have scholars and researchers looking into these pieces of history that really fill our cultures over the years around the world. Wow. Yeah, you're not wrong. That's that's a really interesting point. I was going to ask if you've ever heard of a museum using like a, a Patreon or anything like that. You know, I vaguely remember thinking, like, I kind of think that they may have started experience, experimenting okay. there, but not for hand. So I don't have any off okay. the top of my head examples it's, of that. It seems, like, it seems but, weird to me right off the bat, because I know Patreon is for people and not for organizations. But at the same time, like, it seems like the same sort of, like, a market dynamic, right? There was not a really easy way for, like, independent artists to, to have patrons, I guess, and, and donors and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So Patreon sort of systematized that and made it easy. But I could see that model working really well for exactly what you were describing, right? It's hard to, you know, you're not saving anyone's life. You're really just preserving history. And so it, it has like a lower level of urgency. It doesn't sell really well. And so it's hard to get people to prioritize it. But by making it easy, like Patreon does, to just sort of recurring monthly support things you believe in, maybe that's the right fit for museums. Or maybe there should be an equivalent like uh, support your favorite cultural institutions membership platform. It doesn't exist yet. Maybe that'll be made. Yeah. I totally like that idea. And I think another misconception that general wider audiences might have is um, seeing the numbers that come out of auction results or um, sales of artworks individually from, you know, Van Gogh to Monet, you know, the very, very big name contemporary artists. They're making tens of millions to hundreds of millions of dollars per artwork sale. And that money is out there. The commercial art world, the galleries, the art fairs, they are generating hundreds of millions, billions of dollars a year in the art market. And, you know, their, their clientele are the millionaires, billionaires, 1% of this world. But that doesn't trickle down to museums as much as you would think. Sometimes an art, a museum gets an artwork donated by one of the philanthropists and collectors, and um, sometimes a museum show can drive up the price of an artwork. But again, the museum doesn't get any money from the artwork that's sold by a gallery. They may get a little money or some, they may get a portion of the money if they deaccession an artwork and sell something that's in their collection, but that goes right back into an acquisition fund or in their operating budget. And again, their operating budget is super, super tight across yeah. the board, even at the Met. So it's hard I, to say I, that. I was about to ask if any museums have funded emergencies by selling famous artworks. That seems like a dangerous slope, though. Once you start, then you, you're like selling the part that people are coming to see. Yeah, usually that's frowned upon. And a lot of museums try to steer clear of that, you know, as, unless it's as a last resort. Yeah. Um, one example that comes to mind in the 2000 financial crisis and around the time of the session was the Detroit Art Museum or Detroit Art Institute, Institute of Art Dia. Anyway, okay. they decessioned a lot of their work and they were planning on getting rid of a big portion of their collection. And I think someone bailed them out. They were able to continue operations, but they were one that definitely tried that model and you know, if there's nothing to see when your museum continues to remain open, then you really have a hard time kind of convincing audiences to come. Uh, yeah. So oh, that's heartbreaking. That's really sad. Sometimes you can go to a different museum, which is the best case scenario, but oftentimes right. it goes to a private collector and into the hands of someone that may loan it out eventually or something, but it's inaccessible for, for the most part yeah. in a private collection. Dang. Okay. 
Well, barring artworks that have been sold to private collectors to keep museums afloat, how do you think the rest of us while we're at home can engage with museums now that they're all closed and we can't leave our houses? Yeah. Well, like I mentioned earlier, there are so many cool examples of how museums have... Yeah, we'll definitely have to link a lot of those in the show notes, for sure. Yeah, yeah. There are definitely several roundups I include in the show notes as well. So not... (laughs) The list of links that I have here are linking out to other lists that have hundreds of links in them. And I think that is uh, proof to the point that Museums have been rapidly adopting digital in the last 10, 20 years. And, you know, as much as they can do, they have been doing. And so, the, like I said, the ones that were prepared were the ones that invested heavily in digital over the years and had already digitized much of their collections and started virtual tours, for example. There are actually like 360 degree videos of many museums around the world that you can actually you know, look at. <laughs> walk around, listen to a curator talk and feel really feel like you're there in for, for lack of the actual experience in person. One other fun thing that's sort of uh, their coloring books that museums have provided. There's a collaboration where museums take their artworks and kind of outline them and put them in this uh, open culture website that will vis- cite visitors to download coloring pages and actually like take a famous artwork and, you know, put their own colors on it. And then one of my favorites is actually spearheaded by as much as I, like, as, as far as I can tell, it's just an individual person that came up with this really fun idea. And some of many, many museums have kind of jumped on the bandwagon of this. And the Getty in particular gave a call to action for people to share their own example of an artwork that they recreate through their their you know everyday found objects or quarantine setting so, so cool. I, recreating masterworks I for yeah wish there this instagram page that was started by i think an individual the hand instagram is tucson quarantine and it's out of the netherlands okay and it's in Dutch, but it says to kind of find your house. And then there's a split screen of so many famous artworks that just everyday people have created this is uh, so cool. to, or recreated. Yeah. <laughs> and they're awesome. People have done such an amazing job. It's so cool and entertaining. And the Getty's Call to Action brought in a lot of submissions from their audience they've been reposting a lot of those submissions as well so it's just an example of how to (laughs) actively participate as a viewer and a visitor online with what you have in your house that's those things are really good too like you can hardly tell what's the original (laughs) and what's not oh my gosh (laughs) wow (laughs) i mean and people got so creative and they're so well done it's amazing so i just i absolutely love this campaign and yes it's probably pretty grasped it's someone that's not maybe not a digital marketer by trade but wow they've gotten so so many submissions and input. i mean 428 posts and i'm pretty sure this started when the quarantine started so that's amazing that is so cool oh my gosh my favorite. That's awesome. maybe you need to invite them to the official museum curators group too that's so cool that so many yeah. people are finding really unique ways to to engage with art like that wow i i clicked on your virtual tour link yeah so there are national parks and museums and all of that that offer like interactive virtual tours um, have museums, do you know if museums have ever sold like walkthrough tours with a curator? Is that a thing that people have productized and sold before? As exclusive in person experiences, yes, I think so, especially when it's maybe kind of a renowned cura- curator or yeah. even a scholar that doesn't, that's employed by the museum, will come in as a guest and walk people around the actual exhibition they have up. Mm-hmm. And even artists will sometimes do that. Contemporary artists are still living with shows in museums will do that. But yeah, I think it's always been a challenge. A lot of people in my anecdotal experience have 
sort of expected museum to just be free and open to the public, which would be amazing. And that is the case in DC for the Smithsonian museums. And in, I think, London, a lot of the museums there are free, but they have funding from another source. You know, they're not just kind of generously volunteering. It's not staffed staff all by volunteers. No? Wild. Yeah, so I think it really speaks to the need for philanthropists and higher level donors to step up at this point and also the understanding that individuals can really retain a lot of value out of a $20 admission ticket or a $10 oh, yeah. virtual experience or a $5 or $1 virtual experience and it makes a huge go a long way yeah. when yeah. yeah when snowballed into a larger crowdsourced um, wow. funding source yes very cool um yeah. That's really interesting. What do you think is the easiest way for museums now that they're closed to start doing that sort of thing, to like productize what's inside their museums and start selling tickets online? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think there is cash to pay to there because I don't think many museums want to productize it. They want to be able to provide, a, you know, an accessible means for the audience to come in and, and get the information that they've been providing to people in the physical space for a long time. Mm -hmm. There has to be a way to kind of tier it so that there's a level of you know, easy open access. And then if you want a more in-depth or more deeper learning experience, maybe that for the opportunity to charges. I've also heard talk around monetizing content itself with advertising. Although a lot of museums can't uh, legally, legally do that with their federal funding or city just put an ad on the wall next to the painting. That's yeah. fine. Well, I mean, they all have YouTube accounts. Yeah. You know, so enabling the 30 second ad in the beginning of a YouTube or the you know, like pop up yeah. at the end or whatever. That's like, what you that's, mean. Okay. That could granularly provide a little bit of income here and there. Okay. Or even enabling ads on their websites. Some of them get in the 40s to hundreds of millions of bidders to their sites a year. That's probably small peanuts to a more corporate type of e-commerce site, but... That's pretty cool. Not nothing, yeah. yeah. And that work um, has been done, and these are sites that are robust and have thousands of pages of content them in many cases. So uh, the Mets collection in particular has over 1.2 million objects digitized, I think. That's amazing. So, the the, the yeah, like cover awesome. picture for the the cover picture for Supper Time is a is an image that's in Gallery Seven Fifty One of the Met, and they happen to have a really in depth online page about it. A really in depth online page. So, yeah, while I was while I was doing some research for the, even just the Supper Time homepage, I ran across the Met website. You're right; it's very in depth, extremely. And so there's got to be a way for them to monetize that sort of thing. I have to very cool. If you just go to Landry and right watch now. Supper, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. It it's a pretty cool it's a pretty cool space for I think productizing, but I get that there will probably be some resistance to these legacy institutions productizing the insides of their own buildings for a while. I, I'd be interesting to see if if any museum will take that approach while they're closed. I would love for that to happen at least on like a local small scale, right? Like I could see the Pioneers Museum here in Colorado Springs. It's free and open to the public anyway. Putting something online for like a couple dollars to to you know maybe they can redonate that money and that sort of thing. Would yeah, really cool history see. museums and museums that kind of uh, go way back in time tend to have more of an easier time getting um, the ability to share things online. One thing many, many people don't know that it was something that was sort of a shock to me as well is that museums have a lot of issue with copyright. And if, it, if the artwork in particular is copyrighted, which means that it's That's it was made in the last hundred years. The artist died in the last seventy-five years. You know, there's a copyright holder. Even if the artist is dead, is their foundation or estate that um, that takes the money for you know viewing that artwork outside of the museum's galleries, but put it on a website or in an email or on a social account. Many many times, the museum actually has to pay an organization or the artist themselves to use the image of the artwork in their collection that they own. So there are thousands of images like that in just in single museums in particular. And it's, it's a battle that, you know, there are libraries that are a lot like that too. Yeah. Yeah. But, 
there are libraries like that too that you know don't have license to use any yeah. of the, the stuff they have on record commercially so yeah in the same vein of libraries i've seen some individuals and uh, contacts of mine exploring how to do story times online and, you know, you can to get away with it because you're in such a gray area on digital. But also, technically, you could get caught. You'd have to pay a royalty back or you'd just cease and desist or whatever. And the author of the book can say, no, like, my, you can't read my book on a video. You can read it in a library, like, one off person to person thing, but you can't make a video and record it and put it on Facebook because... Right. You know, there are all sorts of layers of ownership that happen when you upload something to a third party platform as well. Yeah. So, uh, so. What a strange world we live in. Yeah. <laughs> so many nuances. Definitely. I think you and I in our conversation yesterday, we're just going back and forth about like, you're like, why? And I'm like, <laughs> like yeah, I might have a little PSD from <laughs> the frustrations of wanting to be accessible and democratic about things and, and just not being able to with the way laws are laid out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's a it's an interesting time. So that that helps me understand a little bit more what the constraints are as opposed to your usual just charity that's out raising money on social media, why museums can't necessarily just put everything for sale online. It's interesting. Right. Unexpected constraints. But hopefully our cultural institutions can find ways around those and we can all find our way into museums in a productive way in the next year. I know I will miss actually going to galleries and, exactly. and getting to really explore and see things. I'm sure there were so many shows that were scheduled for 2020 that are now just kind of on ambiguous, unidentified length holds. Right. So, and, and a lot of the holds or the postponements are huge challenges because many times uh, exhibitions for individual museums they're borrowing artworks from other museums around the world and their loan agreements are you know timed and it says you can have this till this date and then you have to ship it back and literally when an artwork is shipped across international waters or even across the country it's it doesn't just go on fedex like there's a career that a company like a, a human being person yeah. accompanies the artwork for legal reasons and insurance reasons. And again, insurance is another layer. So uh, that's a cost that museums incur when mounting these huge exhibitions, especially when they're feeling multiple loans from around the world. Every artwork has to be insured. And you can imagine if an artwork is worth $30 million, how much the insurance of that one piece is gonna be. And if you have 200, that's hugely expensive. Yeah, it gets so, logistically insane really fast to think that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of situations like that that have happened in the last two weeks that people are trying to juggle what to do with. Yeah, yeah. But I think you're right that people are going to miss the experiential um, aspect of museums and going yeah. into, the, into the gallery. I remember when I started at the Met in 2009, it was a little bit past this stage, but there were still people that were concerned that if you put an image of the artwork on a website, people aren't going to want to, they don't feel like they need to come anymore. And yeah. that happened to be the opposite. Now we have Instagram FOMO where everybody's taking pictures in the rain room or in a Yakuza installation. And there are lines out the door around the block exactly. to get in because they want to see the same thing they saw on their screen. And, I think um, that's a good thing to, for museums to keep in mind, especially as we make decisions about what we put online in digital tour form, is that every piece of digital media is a form of marketing. It is not a replacement for the real in-person experience. All it's going to do is make everyone talk about it more and want to be there more. It's, that's, all, that's all social media ever does, right, is generate FOMO. Yeah. So for you to worry about replacing the experience of your museum with an online, it's just not going to happen. We're maybe like 50, 100, 1,000 years off from that being real. Like yeah, oh, for now, it's more. We're going to your own wall and you touch it and feel the texture. That then would be maybe. probably yeah. the then maybe. But as people still want to go see them in person. And it's not just about, I mean, it, there is a lot of power in standing in front of an artwork and seeing the texture and changing your angle and yeah. things like that. But it's not just about that. It's about who you're coming with. Like if you're bringing a friend or your grandma or your niece and have those experiences in a one with art being the facilitator or you know, any museum experience, whether it's natural history, dinosaur bones or ace, you know, like exactly. the learning opportunity in a group setting or a, a 
couple setting is really, really valuable. And there's something about just the physical presence of a, a work whatever it happens to be there's something really enticing about being physically there and seeing it this is this is hilarious because it sounds kind of in in contradiction to a lot of the conversations i've had in the last couple of weeks as i started supper time with this thesis of like our in-person experience is over can we maybe just have a meal together and it feels just as good as if we were there in person i think there are some ways where digital is a lot better but i, I really i stand by the fact that it is kind of a form of marketing it's not necessarily a replacement for the in, in-person experience i think even if i were to have a like perfect hologram graphic display of the Mona Lisa that I could touch and change angles and lighting on here in my home, there would still be something special about seeing the original, original, original in the Louvre mm-hmm. and being like, oh, that's the real one. Like, it's, this is not a copy. This is not a simulation. This is like the one that was painted by hand hundreds of years ago. So I don't think that appeal is ever going to go away or be replaced. Yeah. Not to mention that many museums are just architecturally spectacular in their own way, you know, just visiting the space itself and going from room to room to room and you see the Mona Lisa and then you see a Delacroix down the hall and you see, you know, Goya, whatever it is in their collection. And one of my favorite parts was just the physical structure. Like, I think I started a tour one time down in the basement and it was showing, you know, there was old brick, giant brick barracks that were like, wasn't it like a, a hospital or not a hospital, something having to do with the military? It was like a, like a base or something. Okay. This is terrible. We're going to cut this right out. <laughs> <laughs> but the physical space is really important. Um, yeah. Part of the experience, not just the seeing the artwork per person, but also being surrounded by a cool environment. Yeah. Um, and sometimes like a really, really breathtaking environment too. I think the last time you and I got to see each other in person was at the Getty, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was an experience. I mean, just the architecture of being there, just the experience of walking around that place sets you in a like mental context to appreciate the art in a different way. It's really important. So yeah, I don't think that'll go away. Conversely though, just to kind of flip this, the script a little bit, while the in-person is irreplaceable, it's also true that there are millions of people around the world that will never have the opportunity to visit the physical space because of geographical, economic restrictions, whatever it is. Yeah. So digital provides another entry point to share this uh, knowledge and culture that has never been available to museums before. So mm-hmm. why not take advantage of it? Why not yeah. share and enable a wider audience to see it? Because even if a museum is hugely popular and in a big touristy space and they're at capacity 100% of the time, their capacity is limited and it will never ever reach the billions of people that populate the world. You are so right. And I think if more museums approached the next two years with that mindset instead, maybe they'd see enormous growth instead of this, this, uh, contraction because really, I mean, for the first time ever, every museum in the world now has, the whole world as an audience. It's not just who's visiting your city. It's not just who lives there. It's everyone who's at home. They all have to experience your museum the same way. And so you no longer have these like necessary borders because everyone's at home all over the world anyway. So you have a, you have a chance for the first time in our lives for maybe the only time in human history where like your audience is everyone. How are you, what are you going to do with that? Right. If that's not the biggest revenue opportunity in the world for people who can put their, their artworks online, I don't know what it is. That's pretty cool. It's all, it's all kind of how you think about it. Yeah, I agree. And I think just something that came to mind while you're saying that is that it, it does make a sort of a flatter democratic, democratized availability. Like now everyone has to experience these mediums in the digital space for now. Yeah. And even philanthropists and wealthy donors and collectors, okay. the billionaires are sitting at home and there's the jet setter that can like, in their, that are able to travel around the world and visit 60, 100 museums a year, whatever. Mm-hmm. Now they have to find another means and hopefully they will value this, this opportunity and this, this way to provide art to more than just themselves. Wow. Yes. That's awesome. <laughs> hopefully. This is giving me ideas. I wonder if there's like a... Work development, but right fundraising. <laughs> hey. It is. It's maybe a really cool fundraising opportunity too, if you approach it that way. That's really awesome. Yeah, I, I was wondering if maybe there's an opportunity to do like, uh, 
like grouped memberships, like I would, I would pay without a second thought for like a $10 a month, every space museum in the world membership where you could just walk through the galleries in a VR headset, but every space museum, all of them, all of them. I would love that. I would pay for that in a heartbeat and I would never get through every museum. So I'd probably keep paying for it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's a good idea for a way to, for multiple museums to connect with each other and work together to kind of split that, that income if that were to work. And in addition to that idea, another model could be. Crazy when you start thinking about it, that there really are so many opportunities here. It's just, I hope people start thinking about it not necessarily as an emergency, but as an opportunity. Because God knows we all need the distraction the next few months. Yeah, and I think a lot of us that are sitting at home individually, thinking of it as an opportunity, um, trying to find ways to not be bored. I haven't been bored at all. There's so much to do. I've been on a webinar or three every day. And (laughs) it's just an opportunity to kind of Yes, slow down and kind of go back to what's, you know, real and your in-person family relationship where you, with the people you live with and, you know, food and cooking and reading a book, maybe yeah. and reading stuff online too. But like, because of the wealth of the information that the internet provides, I just can't imagine anybody being bored that has an internet connection. You know, it's just, it's different. And I do miss the physical in-person interactions. I mean... Zoom is not the same as having no directly. Sorry, Steve, your hypothesis was not correct. It's fine. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's it's a good replacement, you know, for what we can get for what we have available to us right now. Definitely. And you know, you don't have to be bored. You can find ways to engage with your your people that you know in person. You can meet new people. You can find other like-minded people or learn things from museums or other educational sources. I think there's a lot of online classes that are even free right now. I think the mindfulness kind of classes have really seen a spike in subscriptions and oh yeah we all we all need a little more mindfulness in our lives lately for sure for sure Yeah. yeah well I'm so thankful that I have someone who I can geek out with about fine art and museums and I think now is a more interesting time to think about that than, I, I mean, the last 10 years have been wild anyway, seeing how fine art has, has taken to social media. But now is a particularly interesting time in that game. So this has been really fun to explore. If the people who watch want to learn more about your work and, and see what you're up to lately, uh, what channels do you usually direct people to? Twitter is probably my most professional channel, Twitter and LinkedIn. I do okay. have Instagram and it is public, but it's mostly my cats and my husband and selfies. <laughs> um, landscapes of my beautiful scenery on Lake Tahoe. Yeah, you're in Lake Tahoe, right? Yeah. You should put up our backgrounds for the end of the call. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> your Lake um, Tahoe background is so good. I feel like this is appropriate given. I took that picture on a walk last week. Did you really? Very, so much pride in this. This is this isn't Lake Tahoe itself. This is a lagoon behind Lake Tahoe near my house. Okay. But, wow. Uh, Beautiful. Lake Tahoe itself is beautiful too. I love that. And uh, yeah, if anybody wants to reach out and contact me, you'll put my website in the list of links. And then I have a Medium blog that I just recently started. So I'm trying oh, cool. to relate that with helpful content for okay. particularly for my industry, but it might end up turning more personal sometimes. There you um, go. Yeah. My Twitter is mostly kind of art professional related. Instagram is more personal, but whatever. If you want to follow me there, go for it. We'll make sure to link your socials then so people can check those out. (laughs) That's great. I'm so excited to see what you write on Medium. That'll be awesome. Very cool. Anything else we should chat about before we call it a day? Hmm. What's your favorite museum in the whole entire world? (sighs) Okay, by far, by far, the, what's it called? The Cosmosphere? Is that what it's called in, in Hutchinson, Kansas? It's really niche. Never, it's really know. niche. But the uh, here, let me make sure I'm. I'm. It is called the Cosmosphere. Let me double check. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. Yeah, yeah, it's what it's called. It's great. So I didn't know it existed until my best friend from high school, who's a previous episode, Trevor, got married in Hutchinson, Kansas. His wife is from there, and so for the bachelor party, the like day beforehand, we all went to this museum. <laughs> 
sounds incredibly oh, pretty cool. to the space museum. <laughs> I don't know if it has bachelor party, but fun. yeah. So 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 here's the thing: is that this space museum is like one of the world's best. It is like world class, but it's literally in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. And so I was very curious what happened that like this place started existing. What happened is that the people who founded Kroger are from Hutchinson, Kansas. And they still live there. And so when they sold the whole grocery chain, made out like bandits, they spent all of their money on space stuff. <laughs> they own an SR-71, <laughs> the only full-scale model of the lunar lander currently on Earth except the one that NASA owns. Oh, my gosh. They have the only camera that was brought back from the moon by astronauts because most of them got left there because it's extra weight. The only camera that was brought back from the moon wow. they have in Hutchinson, Kansas. And a, like a bajillion other really, really cool artifacts. It's incredible. It's like, like it should be, all of it should be in the Smithsonian, but it's not. <laughs> it's very cool. The it's Smithsonian very, has enough things. Yeah, that goes to the that even small museums are hugely interesting and important because, you know, who who would expect to be able to see those kind of artifacts in Kansas? But people in Kansas, I'm sure, appreciate that in their neighborhood. Yes, exactly. And visitors to Kansas, like yourself. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, very that's enthusiastic so cool. visitor to Kansas. It is. It it's like a pretty good motivator to go back to the middle of nowhere, Kansas, on a regular basis. It's a very, very cool institution. So if I if I can figure out how to get that space membership built, <laughs> that will be the first museum that goes in the space membership package. Yes, I think you're onto something with these collaborative membership models that yeah. you know, don't have to be super expensive and super high. Well, you know, I mean, maybe it is just access to certain areas of the collection or um, scholarship that, that is not available to the general public, but that you could get for relatively low cost. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the right approach. I'm going to call them Monday morning. <laughs> Give them a call. Ask them if they're on board. Send someone out there to do a 360 tour of it. I just think that would be so cool. So, yeah. How about you? What's your favorite museum? <sighs> I'm not creative at all because mine is pretty easily guessed. Mine is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You're a little biased. Um, it just, it's so spectacular and incredible uh, of a space and of a collection. And notwithstanding my time there, when I worked there for five years, I got to see a lot of behind the scenes stuff that made me fall more in love with it. And not to say it wasn't a challenging time sometimes working there. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of like a, um, a bit of a letdown of expectations when you're like, at your dream job and then you're like, oh, I got to go work nine to five every day. And there's <laughs> jerks in different departments sometimes. And you're like, yeah. it's like a meeting your heroes kind of thing. You're like, oh, it's it's also real life. Like, even though it is the best museum in the world. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. And it. even though I was working like past midnight some nights when we relaunched the website, Wow. The icing on the cake was walking through the galleries in pitch darkness and so walking cool. like every other gallery would have the light on and then the other one wouldn't and then the next one would and then the other one wouldn't. I remember walking into the Egyptian wing on the way out, which is where we always had to go. And on one side is the Book of the Dead printed on papyrus from 3,000 years ago. And on the other side is a, is a glass case with mummies and stuff. And when that gallery was dark... All you could see was the mummy at the end who had a white face. <laughs> oh, white face. <laughs> oh, this terrifying. is so terrifying. I can't then, believe like, it. I don't know if I believe in ghosts, but there have to be like lots of spirits in that museum in particular. Yeah, if ghosts um, are real, they're for sure hanging out in the Met. That is so incredible. Wow. Yeah, those kind of memories stuck with me and will never be forgotten. And you know, okay. another one was a thunderstorm while I was sitting in the Temple of Dender alone at like nine o'clock at night and I saw lightning coming down like out the big glass window that's kind of diagonal. Oh my God. That's so freaky. So, it will always, always be my favorite museum. But of course, LACMA is another contender. Musée d'Orsay in Paris is amazing. I love impressionism and those yeah. that style of work. And you know, most inner art museums. So oh, the Norton Science so in Pasadena is kind of my original home museum. Oh, where cool. I grew up. Oh, that's awesome. They all have nothing on the cosmosphere in Kansas. <laughs> you have to take me there. I'm meeting you in okay. Kansas sometimes. That sounds great. 
The moment that we're allowed to leave our houses, we'll do it. That sounds wonderful. Thank you so much for talking with me, Lucy. This was a blast. This is awesome. Thanks. This is really fun. This is yeah. an amazing idea, and I'm excited to watch more episodes, too. I've seen a couple, but um, you're creating amazing content. And Thanks. Just you're really sweet. providing a resource for people to engage with. So thanks. I'm really excited about it. I think it's going well. This has been fun. Okay. I will talk to you soon.